So the objectives will be to review the epidemiology of valvular heart disease, just to get a, a sense of the scope of the problem. And then we'll review the current and emerging transcatheter valve uh, therapies. So here's a question for you. This is a 74 year old male with minimally symptomatic severe aortic valve stenosis is referred for con consideration of for aortic valve replacement. Echocardiogram shows severe aortic valve stenosis and left ventricular ejection fraction of 65%, so normal EF. Grade one diastolic dysfunction, no other valvular heart disease, normal pulmonary pressures. He would like TAVR, um, even though he's a good candidate for open heart surgery uh, because of low surgical risk. Um, and he has no other indications for open heart surgery. Uh, so what would you um, do for him? So you would deny TAVR and offer SAVR. Um, so deny transcatheter valve replacement and offer surgical aortic valve replacement because there's low risk for open heart surgery. Proceed with evaluation for TAVR. Uh, defer intervention for now because it only has mild symptoms and same back in six months. Or defer intervention for now and have him return in six months because there's a normal left ventricular ejection fraction. Okay, so it was 56% last time, it's 58%. All right, so this is a learning opportunity again. Right? Okay, good. So just uh, briefly review the epidemiology of valve disease. So valvular heart disease has been termed sort of the classic um, disease of the changing etiology of, uh, of disease. Because originally it was rheumatic heart disease, a lot of rheumatic heart disease, mitral stenosis. This was the original form of valve disease that we're all concerned about. In the developed countries, economically developed countries, there's been a decline in the incidence and prevalence of rheumatic heart disease, but an emergence of these degenerative valve disease, and we call them degenerative because they're linked to aging. And then an emergence of this other valve disease uh, from radiation, from putting in pacemakers uh, and so forth. So now instead of being faced with rheumatic mitral stenosis and rheumatic mitral valve uh, regurgitation, we're seeing degenerative mitral valve uh, um, disease and calcific degenerative aortic valve uh, disease, as well as these uh, sort of uh, examples of radiation induced valvular heart disease a combination of mitral uh, disease as well as aortic valve uh, disease. And as I said, of course, uh, pacemaker-induced uh, um, uh, tricuspid regurgitation and so forth. Now, we looked at the distribution of valvular heart disease in this population-based studies and saw that uh, much of the burden is shifted towards the elderly. So the older you get, the higher the risk of valve disease. And most of this is driven by mitral valve regurgitation. But the most common intervention to any valve is for aortic stenosis because that's less tolerated than mitral valve regurgitation. So a lot of valvular heart disease as people get older. And then uh, the finding of valvular heart disease, and this is just in randomly selected population-based uh, uh, people. Uh, if you have valvular heart disease, uh, then your survivorship is less than people that don't have it. So it's common and it's not benign and is associated with decreased survival uh, over time. There's gross undertreatment of valvular heart disease. This is data from Olmsted County, looking at survival after diagnosis for isolated motor to severe mitral valve regurgitation, stratified by low ejection fraction or normal ejection fraction. And you can see that the survivorship is really terrible for people with isolated mitral valve regurgitation, whether you have a preserved or reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. And when we looked at the total number of uh, or percent of uh, patients that had some kind of repair, replacement or something, it was only 15% out of the cohorts. And this is in Olmsted County where the Mayo Clinic is and we have all the percutaneous things and the surgery and all of that. So gross under treatment of, uh, of valve uh, lesions and it's associated with uh, worse outcomes. Now, this is not a, a new finding because this was uh, seen also in 2007 in a Euro heart survey when they looked at management of patients with valve disease across Europe and found that surgery was denied in as much as half of the patients with sim symptoms in aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation. And that older age and left ventricular dysfunction were the characteristics most strongly associated with absence of surgery uh, 
and that these risk factors may be overstressed, meaning that people are inappropriately denied intervention because of old age and, and heart failure. So which is where the uh, transcatheter uh, people came in uh, because even for transcatheter valve replacement, the, um, uh, the impetus for developing that was so you could treat patients that were inappropriately denied uh, surgery because of older age or um, heart failure. So we have a lot of uh, options now for different uh, valve uh, diseases. So we'll start with aortic valve stenosis. As you know, this is a, a pressure overload uh, lesion causing extreme uh, LVH in some cases um, and associated with heart failure it can be complicated by atrial fibrillation and everything else. And uh, for patients with symptomatic aortic valve stenosis, mild symptoms or more symptoms, and people with reduced left ventricular ejection fraction need aortic valve uh, replacement. TAVR was um, uh, compared to surgery in high risk patients, intermediate risk patients, low risk patients, and then was compared to medical therapy um, in uh, those that were at prohibitive risk. And it's really done very well uh, against uh, surgical aortic valve replacement, including in intermediate uh, 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 and low risk uh, patients where there's lower mortality with TAVR favorable uh, valve uh, hemodynamics and faster recovery um, and, um, and so forth. So, so very uh, a good performance of TAVA versus, versus open heart uh, surgery in a broad uh, range of uh, patients and, and in the, uh, multiple clinical trials. So now the, the guidelines, uh, 2020 guidelines for patients with severe uh, symptomatic aortic valve stenosis TAVR is a class one indication, whether you are low surgical risk, intermediate risk, high risk, or prohibitive uh, surgical risk. And of course, uh, there are patients who maybe we should not intervene on uh, who are more appropriate for uh, palliative uh, therapy. And the discussion gets trickier here, uh, where some of these patients are candidates for open heart surgery. Um, so there are factors that favor surgery and other factors that favor uh, TAVR, but TAVR is a class one indication now for even low risk uh, individuals. And this is just an example of you know, how we do it. Um, this is a transfemoral um, uh, excess, one of the sapient valves. You just basically, you know, this is a balloon expandable valve and within 10 seconds, you've replaced somebody's valve you know, without opening their chest, without um, you know, uh, any of those things involved in open heart surgery and uh, very good hemodynamics uh, post-op. And the patients really are back to doing normal things fairly quickly following TAVR. In fact, now there's a, a idea that, you know, if somebody, you know, has TAVR early enough in the morning that they could leave that afternoon, leave the hospital that afternoon and not have to spend, you know, five or seven days in the hospital as they would with open heart surgery. There are ongoing TAVR trials looking at TAVR and bicuspid aortic valves. And then there's early TAVR, which is asymptomatic severe aortic valve stenosis versus surveillance. So this is a hot topic of when to intervene in someone who has asymptomatic aortic stenosis and normal ejection fraction. So there, there's a trial ongoing for that. And then there's TAVR unload. So if you have patients with moderate aortic stenosis, but have a reduced left ventricle ejection fraction below 50% and they're symptomatic, there's a trial to see if doing TAVR in those patients versus guideline directed medical therapy uh, would be uh, beneficial. So this is an ongoing trial called TAVR uh, Unload. Now we talked about perivalvular um, uh, problem being an issue sometimes with, uh, with this transcatheter um, with TAVR. It's less of a problem now with, with newer iterations of the, of the valve. Uh, but we can also uh, manage these perivalvular leaks percutaneously. So in the past, patients with perivalvular leaks had to go back for redo open heart surgery, but we can manage these now uh, percutaneously. They're more common in TAVR um, uh, than uh, SAVR, but we use these per perivalvular um, uh, leak plugs uh, to treat any perivalvular leak in any position uh, we, can, we can treat with, uh, with the plug. We've actually shown that successful uh, perivalvular leak closure is associated with improved survival. These are patients that had mitral perivalvular leaks. And so, you know, this is a good uh, transcatheter um, um, uh, technique for, for managing these patients. 
Um, there's a lot of imaging. This is just an example of someone who had persistent dyspnea after TAVR and had, um, and had a diastolic murmur and a perivalvular uh, leak. So we combine, you know, echocardiography, CT scan, and all of that uh, in their uh, evaluation. And we thought the patient was a good candidate for perivalvular leak uh, closure with a plug. Um, and so you go, you know, transfemoral, retrograde, and uh, cannulate the, the um, uh, hole here or the uh, site, and then um, and then just inflate and deploy this uh, this vascular plug, um, and these things work uh, work really well. Okay, so what about mitral valve uh, regurgitation? <clears throat> uh, as you guys know, we divide the um, uh, ideology of mitral valve regurgitation uh, into primary, where the problem is the valve uh, leaflet itself or the valvular apparatus. So that's primary uh, degenerative mitral valve regurgitation. And really surgery is recommended for primary uh, mitral valve uh, regurgitation problems. So flail, prolapse, uh, and all of that. And then we we'll also have secondary mitral valve regurgitation where the problem is not so much the valve, but it's maybe the ventricle. So the ventricle has gotten bigger, it's uh, remodeled, and it's uh, sort of displaced the subvalvular apparatus and then causing malcoaptation of the leaflets and, and causing the valve to leak. That can happen uh, from a ventricular side of things, but it can also happen from atrial dilatation. There's this new uh, entity being described of atrial functional MR, particularly in patients with atrial fibrillation, where the left atrium gets huge. Um, it also affects the tricuspid valve, but it gets big enough, it, it dilates the annulus and then the valve, and then the valve leaks. Okay, those are, those are forms of secondary or functional mitral valve regurgitation. Now, for functional mitral valve regurgitation, there's really no, enthousi no enthusiasm to operate because in the majority of the cases, if it's, it's, it's a ventricular problem and not a primary valve problem. And so if you, if you operate on the valve, you haven't really solved uh, the problem. And there've been many trials, surgical trials, looking at operating on functional mitral valve regurgitation and, and the appetite is very, uh, uh, very low for that. Uh, we do use the uh, mitral clip for these patients with uh, symptomatic uh, functional mitral valve regurgitation. And this is data from the COEP trial showing that, you know, if you maximize your, um, you know, medical therapy for these patients and they still have residual mitral valve regurgitation and they're still symptomatic, then closing the valve with the clip is helpful. Okay. So this is data from the COEP trial. So for patients with uh, symptomatic functional mitral valve regurgitation um, that doesn't respond to optimal medical therapy, uh, the uh, mitral clip or uh, uh, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair, they call it TIR now, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair, is, is an option for those patients. Now we do use the mitral clip for primary mitral regurgitation in patients that are high risk for open heart surgery. Um, so remember we said for primary MR surgery is the better than, than the clip, but we can use the clip for those patients who are high uh, surgical risk um, and, uh, and it works uh, really well. Data from the TVT registry showing uh, really good outcomes in terms of uh, death and rehospitalizations. Uh, with uh, with a mitral uh, mitral clip, uh, we do some neat uh, things uh, intra procedure, looking at um, you know left atrial pressures while we're while we're doing this because sometimes it can be hard to tell with the echo how much residual regurgitation there is there, and uh, more often than not, people end up getting more than one clip. You know, you do one clip and there's still residual MR but we can do simultaneous LA pressure monitoring to decide whether we need to do a second clip or even a third clip. Um, and this patient ended up having two clips and, and marked reduction in uh, left, atrial, left atrial pressures. And a reduction in your left atrial pressures uh, or V-wave is associated with uh, improvements, uh, functional improvement. And so while some labs don't use intracardiac pressure monitoring during interventional procedures for valves, uh, we do both for the mitral and the, and the tricuspid valve, and we found it uh, very uh, helpful in that regard. Uh, 
Uh, we looked at anatomic predictors of success for the mitral clips. You know, if you have a single flail and you have a single jet and you have really good 3D uh, image quality, uh, these are predictors of a successful uh, uh, mitral, uh, mitral clip. Now, there's a lot, I mean, a lot happening uh, in the space. In addition to transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair, people are looking at uh, percutaneous valves. So we're going through the groin or transapical or transeptal to place mitral valves. So you do a mitral valve replacement uh, percutaneously uh, instead of through uh, open heart surgery. And this is just uh, one of the devices, you know, showing uh, this is an M3 uh, device. Um, and they all have different designs and different, you know, uh, approaches to this. But this one has an anchoring system where you put this coil around uh, the base of the, of the valve and around the leaflets. And then once you have that securing a coil, then you go ahead and uh, deploy the Sapien valve inside that coil. So you have a, an anchoring system and then you put a valve inside that anchor system and you end up with a, you know, percutaneous mitral valve, uh, mitral valve uh, replacement. Uh, we also do, you know, uh, mitral valve and valve for degenerated valve. So a valve and valve, we can do valve inside a valve, percutaneous valve inside a valve for, you know, previous percutaneous valve or for surgical valves and in any position. So mitral position, tricuspid position, and um, an aortic valve uh, position. So a tra transeptal is just an ex example of transeptal valve in valve or valve in ring uh, or valve in uh, native valve. One of the things that's being um, explored uh, really actively now are these patients with mitral annular calcification, severe mitral annular calcification symptoms, mitral stenosis, not good candidates for open heart surgery, um, whether you can do a percutaneous um, a transcatheter heart valve inside a native valve and, and treat that mitral stenosis. Really uh, complicated uh, uh, sets of patients with a lot of uh, comorbidities, but, um, but this uh, transcatheter mitral valve in MAC um, is an ongoing area of, uh, of investigation. Now, and then we'll switch our attention to the uh, tricuspid valve uh, for the last few minutes here. Um, so tricuspid valve regurgitation, uh, most of the time it's functional. Uh, there's dilatation of the annulus that leads to malcoaptation of the leaflets and then severe mitral regurgitation, or tricuspid regurgitation. But as we said before, also the patients that have pacemakers put in are at higher risk of severe tricuspid valve regurgitation just because of interaction of the leaflets with the, with, um, with the lead. Um, and then atrial fibrillation is one of the leading causes of functional mitral valve or functional tricuspid valve regurgitation. Um, and so, and these patients really don't do uh, well. We know that severe tricuspid regurgitation is associated with reduced uh, uh, survivorship. So there's a lot of interest uh, in these patients because they're also sort of a higher uh, surgical risk uh, patient with uh, operative mortality of around 10% when you operate on them. So there's a lot of interest in uh, percutaneous technologies uh, to treat tricuspid valve regurgitation. Uh, different mechanisms of, of treatment, the annuloplasty techniques, and then there are these uh, leaflet plications or edge-to-edge -edge, uh, repair. Uh, I showed you the mitral clip, but there's also the Pascal device. One of the big differences between the mitral clip and the Pascal device is that the mitral clip, you have to grab both leaflets at the same time, you know, but then the Pascal device, you can grab one leaflet and then go around and search and then grab the other leaflet. So really some good uh, uh, innovation uh, coming out of this. There was a spacer uh, one called the former uh, device for uh, treatment of uh, tricuspid valve regurgitation. And basically this was to say, okay, if you have this big gaping you know, orifice uh, for mitral regurgitation, what if you just put a spacer in there and just reduce the amount of regurgitation? Worked well if you could get it in there safely. Um, there were some good outcomes initially in the early feasibility uh, studies, um, but uh, the device, the design of the delivery system, and then this anchoring system, which is like barbed wire almost in, in the right ventricle, you know, was associated with uh, significant complications. And so this has been abandoned, right? So this is just to say, 
you know, there's a lot of trial and error uh, in his patients. Um, but this, you know, I mean, it was a good idea, but it just, it just didn't pan out, uh, pan out that well. This is an example of the cardio band uh, that you can use for tricuspid regurgitation as well as mitral regurgitation, just to cinch the annulus close together and bring those leaflets uh, close together and reduce the mitral or the tricuspid regurgitation or the mitral regurgitation. And uh, early feasibility uh, trials were really um, uh, favorable uh, for, for this, uh, for this uh, technique and, and uh, um, uh, more trials are, are ongoing. So, um, and then I'll close with, with this uh, Pascal case, this edge to edge uh, repair case. So this is a, an example of tricuspid valve regurgitation, a lot of uh, color going back into the right atrium here. And, um, and this patient had this uh, edge to edge repair with a Pascal device. You can see here that we've grabbed one of the leaflets. And then if you pay close attention on this side, you can see the other gripper coming down to grab the other, uh, the other uh, leaflets. And um, again, you know, you can put more than one uh, of these uh, depending on, uh, uh, on the outcome of, of the first one. Um, so this is the pre um, Pascal device. And then this is the post uh, Pascal device. And this patient had two uh, devices uh, put in. And again, this is an ongoing uh, trial using edge-to-edge -edge repair for, for tricuspid regurgitation. And this is just some 3D images pre here on the left and then post uh, uh, images on the, on the right. And then we get to do some neat things, you know, with, uh, with 3D echo now, you know, why not make it look pretty, right? So standard 3D view, true view, and then the glass view here on the right, uh, this patient with two devices uh, put in uh, with a mark reduction in, in severity of tricuspid valve regurgitation. So um, there's a lot happening in this space. Um, you know, I didn't show you everything, but it's sort of, a, you know, on the same vein, you know, what, what device can you use? How does it work? You know, um, and, and all of that. So in summary, the burden of valvular heart disease is, um, is high and, and will increase just because of the aging uh, population. Um, a high proportion uh, of valvular heart disease is undetected. There's data out there to show that we sort of miss valve disease. We don't send people for echo when they should get an echo. And I think for your patients, whether they're doing, you know, because some of these patients are asymptomatic, they've had murmurs for years, uh, but we don't know what the murmur is from, you know? So I would say get an echo, define the nature of the valve lesion, and then put that patient on some form of surveillance if that's what they need or, or intervene. So high proportion of undetected and undertreated uh, valve disease. Transcatheter valve therapy is the first line of therapy, uh, first option uh, for many of these patients, particularly for tricuspid valve. And then there's new uh, transcatheter therapies under active um, investigation. And uh, just to acknowledge everyone that's involved in all of this, you know, the heart failure clinic should be in here somewhere as well, but you know, you're part of the heart valve team, uh, right? So a lot of coordination from a lot of services to, to, make this, uh, to make this happen. And with that, I will close. Thank you. <laughs>